Chapter four is going to focus on carbon and its role with living things. So organic chemistry is known as the study of compounds that contain carbon. And living organisms are primarily composed of these carbon-based compounds. Um, carbon, so you're going to see throughout this chapter, is able to make lots of different structures, can be a part of lots of different types of molecules. It's what makes up your four macromolecules, your protein, your nucleic acid, your carbohydrates, and your lipids. And that is one of the characteristics of living things is that they are composed of compounds made of carbon. There are organic compounds that can be very simple, and then there are ones that are definitely uh, much, much larger. The vast majority of your organic compounds will also have hydrogen present um, bonded to some of those carbon atoms. The idea of organic molecules um, was initially thought of just to be found in living um, individuals, living things. And so vitalism was what that was called. And scientists were able to um, perform experiments and obtain evidence that that was not necessarily the case, that there were organic compounds that were able to be formed um, without having any living substance involved in their synthesis. Um, that has led to um, the viewpoint of mechanism that all natural phenomena are governed by both your physical and your chemical laws. And we're going to see this with Miller's experiment showing how he was able to synthesize organic compounds abiotically without living factors. Um, there is um, some evidence that some abiotic synthesis of organic compounds, especially like near volcanoes, sparks along those lines, might have played a role in the origin of life. Um, but that is still being examined at this time. So here we have um, his experiment. You have the water making up the sea. Uh, the water was heated and it turned into water vapor. And when it interacted with um, his version of the atmosphere that contained methane and ammonia and hydrogen um, and was sparked by the electrode, it was able to cause the water vapor to condense. Um, it was cooled by the cold water surrounding. Um, that condenser and as samples of that cooled rain, which is what the condenser is intending to mimic, um, were um, examined, they found things like formaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide and some amino acids and even some hydrocarbons. Compounds that they, before, um, with vitalism, they did not think were possible to be made abiotically. So, Carbon is super powerful because it has its four valence electrons. I talk about electron configuration here. Um, carbons, um, when you draw those dots out, will have two electrons in its first energy level, and it will have four more electrons in its second energy level. And the goal for virtually all elements is to get a total of eight electrons to complete their valence shell. Um, because carbon is right there in the middle, it's able to make lots of different compounds of lots of different sizes um, because of the sheer number of places it has for additional electrons. Um, if you have elements that are not right there in the middle, that's going to have an influence on to whether they lose or gain their electrons. But carbon having the four valence electrons will make um, four covalent bonds, and sometimes it'll make three where one will be a multiple. Um, and it, depending on what is present in your molecule, if you have carbon atoms that are bonded to four other atoms, um, that particular carbon will have a tetrahedral shape. If you have a carbon that's bonded to three other types of atoms, because maybe one of those is a double bond, then you'll have the shape of a triangle, trigonal planar. And here you can see some examples of that. Here you see with methane, um, the tetrahedral shape present in the ball and stick model. Um, with ethane, you've got two carbons, and they are both bonded to four other um, atoms. So you have the tetrahedral on both sides of the molecule. 
whereas in ethene, you have that double bond present between the carbon atoms, so you actually only have three different atoms um, bonded to each carbon, and that's what's going to cause the trigonal planar shape to form, the triangle in the shape of a linear plane. Valences of carbon are going to differ from valences of other elements. The um, valences of a particular group of elements on the periodic table will be consistent. So carbon and silicon are both going to have valences of four. They're both going to have four valence electrons in their outermost shell. Hydrogen is only going to have a valence of one. It only has that first energy level available. It's got one electron in it, and it wants to be able to pair it. Oxygen and nitrogen are going to have valences of two and three respectively. Oxygen is in group 16. It has six valence electrons, so it needs two more to complete its shell. While nitrogen in group 15 has five valence electrons, it would need three more electrons to fill its shell. And because oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen have places where they need additional electrons, carbon might be a potential source for those electrons. So there are some examples of carbon bonding with oxygen and carbon bonding with nitrogen. There's a lot of diversity within organic molecules, especially within the skeleton that makes up these carbon-based compounds. Um, they can have different amounts of carbon. They can have different locations for their multiple bonds. They could have branching where some of the carbons aren't just necessarily connected together in a straight line. Or they could kind of connect together with each other and form rings. Hydrocarbons are going to consist of just carbon and hydrogen. Um, your lipids um, are going to have hydrocarbon components. That's what makes up your membranes. Um, we also are going to see hydrocarbons present in, um, as an energy source. That's what we use for fuel to get vehicles around. Um, when hydrocarbons are able to undergo reactions, specifically combustion reactions, they are able to release significant amounts of energy. Isomers are going to be different forms of the same compound. Um, so when they have different forms, they may have different properties. Structural isomers are going to have the same amounts of all elements present in that compound, but they're not going to be arranged exactly the same. They're going to have a physical difference between them. Cis-trans isomers are going to be present in compounds that have a carbon-carbon double bond, where you have the same groups attached to each carbon, but they aren't necessarily arranged in three dimensions the same. And then with enantiomers, you're going to have um, compounds that contain carbon, and at least one of the carbons in that compound will be attached to four different types of um, atoms or larger groups of molecules. And the two enantiomers are going to appear to be the same, but when we look at it in three dimensions, they won't be connected to that chiral carbon, the carbon with four different groups attached to it. They won't be connected exactly the same. They will be what's called a mirror image. And why that's going to play a key role, um, here you see an example of structural. Um, you can see the physical difference there with the cis-trans, how the X's are on opposite sides of the double bond um, with the trans, but on the same side with the cis. And the enantiomers, how you've got the carbon bonded to four different groups, but in one of the um, enantiomers, the um, you're seeing the connections go in a clockwise direction, and the other one you're seeing them go in a counterclockwise direction if you were looking at them exactly in the same order. So I said I was going to touch on enantiomers a little bit more. These play a pretty key role with pharmaceuticals because one form of a particular compound may have um, really um, beneficial um, impact for whether it be humans or other animals or offs, um, other species that might benefit from it, while the other form of it, just by that mirror image, may not be active and may not do um, any good or potentially could be harmful. So um, enantiomers only have a slight difference. You would see it in three dimensions, but they definitely can have a significant impact. You've seen from some of the um, 
pictures that I've shown you so far that there are other groups attached to organic molecules um, besides that carbon skeleton with some hydrogen atoms on it. And we're just going to touch on some of those different groups um, in a second. Those groups are referred to as functional groups. Um, and when you have these functional groups present, you tend to have different, um, certain characteristics um, that we see in these molecules. And you also see these groups undergo specific types of reactions. So the first functional group we're going to talk about is a hydroxyl. We tend to see these with our alcohols. This is what um, will allow those to hydrogen bond because you have that electronegative oxygen. And so that is part of why alcohols are able to dissolve um, ionic substances and um, molecular substances with polar components, just like water. Carbonyl is going to be next, the C double bonded to the O. Um, you can have two ways to see that C double bonded to an O. It could be at the very end of a molecule when it's going to be present as an aldehyde, or it could be in between carbon atoms where it is going to be considered a ketone. We see both of those with sugars. When you have the same number of carbons present with that carbonyl group in different locations, you would have structural isomers. And when you have those structural isomers, you're going to have different physical properties for the two substances. The next one we're going to talk about is going to combine the two functional groups we've done so far, the carboxyl, which is going to have this carbonyl, C double bonded O, and then you're going to have the OH attached to that carbon. When these are present, and they will um, be a part of our amino acids, that's one example of them offhand, um, the carboxyl group acts as an acid and donates its proton so that it will make a negatively charged ion and release hydrogen ions. And you see that down there in the example part where you go from non-ionized to ionized. In cells, that's how we find it. We see that it has donated its proton. It will be found as the carboxylate ion, just seed with the double bonded O and then the other single bonded O with it, and it'll have a negative charge. Our next example is going to kind of work in the opposite direction, but it's going to do the same thing, the amino group, a nitrogen bonded to hydrogen atoms. Um, these are also a part of our amino acids, and nitrogen, being electronegative, is more than willing to pick up an extra proton, so it can act as a base. It can take a proton from, say, water, and when it does that, it's going to produce um, NH3+. That is the form we find it in cells we find it with that positive charge. Sulfhydryls are commonly found in thiols. They will have a sulfur bonded to a hydrogen atom. So um, they are too found with an amino acid. They're specifically found with a cysteine amino acid. And when you have cysteine residues that are close to one another, they will actually um, go through a chemical reaction and form a covalent bond where the sulfurs will be connected to one another. When they cross-link like this, it helps to stabilize their structure. And this is how um, what has to be broken if you want to take curly hair and make it straight. Or if you do want to take straight hair and make it curly, you basically have to break any connections that exist and reform new ones to get those kinks to stay. Phosphates are part of our nucleic acids. We're also going to talk about them in the form of ATP. So you have that phosphorus with the four O's attached to it. Um, because it is a negatively charged molecule, um, it is able to um, react with water and release energy. Methyls are carbons attached to hydrogen atoms. We will see um, these attached to DNA, which can either impact on the whether the genes actually are able to go through transcription and translation. Um, we also can see it um, have an impact with female and male sex hormones. When that methyl group is attached, that can um, impact on the hormone's shape as well as its function. So just a little bit more about ATP. Um, here, ATP is your energy currency in your cell. 
when ATP is present and you need energy, you're going to break off one of those phosphate groups to generate ADP and phosphate ion. When that phosphate ion comes off, it's also going to release a, a significant amount of energy. And then when additional phosphates come around, they can bind back to ADP, the two phosphates attached to adenosine, and reform ATP. So what you've seen so far is just with carbon alone, carbon is responsible for this tree over here with your globin genes. You've got your ancestral one. It was able to make the myoglobin genes. It's able to produce both the fetal and the adult hemoglobin genes um, just with the chemistry associated with carbon. So carbon's versatility enables it to make lots of different organic molecules and is going back again to our genetic information and how it's influencing the protein products that are formed.